for those who have come tonight, thank you very much. We really appreciate your interest in this topic, which is incredibly important. Um, I want to uh, draw your attention to this uh, picture up here, but just by way of pointing out how scary prisoners and former prisoners are. So where's June at? Is he still downstairs? So he's on the left, and Pollard, I guess he's still downstairs also, but they were, Men's Warehouse gives us clothing every year to give to people uh, who've come out of prison and who obviously need clothing, and they've done it for three years, and so they were up cleaning up the clothing room a couple weekends ago, and the next thing I knew, uh, somebody put on Facebook, uh, pictures <laughs> of these two guys up on the second floor of the, of the central building modeling dresses. <laughs> so um, we're going to uh, have a, a, a really great panel tonight, and I want to talk to them about them for just a minute because I won't introduce them um, when they come up. What, what's going to happen is after I speak for just a few more minutes, uh, we're going to start, Don will start a um, CNN video, which was the first news story that broke in 1995 after Jesse Trinidad's brother was murdered at the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City. And that'll play for about eight minutes, and then Jesse will come up uh, and, and, uh, and go. And at the point he finishes, we'll, we'll have 45 minutes less for Q&A. And on, on the panel, um, we've got Mark Niles, who was the dean of Seattle University Law School. And um, I'm going to just read, his accomplishments are like uh, amazing. I'm going to read a little bit of it so I don't forget anything. But, uh, and, and Dean Niles, could you maybe just stand up if you don't mind? Thanks. Yeah, <laughs> OK. Um, well, it's about three years ago, he uh, came to Seattle U Law School, and he's a professor of law. He teaches in addition to his duties as dean, um, and he's really interested, so I won't, I won't read the bio, but he, he's super interested in this topic, as he'll explain to you. Um, sitting behind Dean Niles is Kim Gordon. Would you please stand? Um, Kim is uh, with Gordon and Saunders, which is a public defense firm that has helped our students uh, over the years, and uh, and in some cases, it's literally saved lives. Uh, and and uh, and and one of those cases is the little short, skinny guy closest to me in the photo up here, um, who was extradited wrongfully to Alaska. Um, and uh, on a violation that shouldn't have taken place and uh, Kim and her partner took three days to figure out that Alaska had made a mistake, and two months later, um, Dolphy Jordan and Jenna Melman and I went, took the train down to the airport <clears throat> and met him as he came off the concourse, which was pretty cool, and saw him with his family uh, reunited. And then um, Lizzie Reed is a student of ours, and uh, Lizzie, Elizabeth A. Reed, stand up, turn around. Um, she's um, kind of along the lines of these images here. She's everything that the Seattle Times won't tell you about prisoners and former prisoners. She's clean and sober. She's got a perfect 4.0 GPA at Green River Community College. Uh, she won the Martin Achievement Scholarship Award, $25,000 they're paying. There, here's the little short, skinny guy, <laughs> and uh, uh, they're they're paying her last year at Green River Community College, and then her first year at UW, uh, and she's she's rocking the world. Um, one of the handouts up here, which I hope everyone will come up and get from this table, is an essay she wrote that she's courageously stood and read at Kane Hall at the University of Washington on April 11th. And um, I'll, we'll, we'll get into that uh, later. Um, Jesse Trenadu will be on the panel with the three that I just introduced, and I think everybody who's here already knows about Jesse. Jesse was a, a successful sports attorney, 
living that life in Salt Lake City, uh, a former All-American at a little teeny tiny college down in Southern California called USC. Um, and uh, uh, his brother was murdered. And, uh, and you'll learn so much about that story tonight. And he's been fighting battles for justice for 17 years since 1995. And, and so the story you'll see tonight will say all that needs to be said about that. Warren Etheridge, where are you? So, so Warren's going to moderate the panel tonight, and Don's probably thrilled. And uh, uh, June and I and uh, some others that are here, uh, Caroline Cumming, where are you, um, met Warren when five of us from the post-prison education program attended the three-week intensive film school, uh, which was life-changing. Um, and Lizzie's going to be doing it next summer, and I think Gina, who I don't, I know she's there, but I don't see her, uh, will be also. So um, Warren uh, hosts a, a, a show called The High Bar, which is, a, he's an amazing, amazing, amazing interviewer. Uh, and he also writes a blog called The Warren Report. And you might Google both of those. They're really incredible. Uh, and he's an incredible talent. So um, I want to just tell you, I want to read three things to you, tell you about the handouts, and then let the CNN video start, and I'll get off the stage. But I, I want people to know um, about the post-prison education program and uh, its students uh, and the impact of, of our work. So um, earlier this week, I got an email from the mother of, um, of a former prisoner. And I'm just going to read some of it. Um, and she was writing to friends of hers asking that they support this event tonight. And she said, um, many of us have been impacted directly or indirectly by having someone we love incarcerated. For me, it was my son <clears throat> who was in and out of prison or jail for much of the last 20 years. We were able to get him involved in the post-prison education program while he was in work release several years ago, and for the first time, he's clean and sober, working, newly married, and a new father. Um, his life has purpose, and I believe this would not be so, uh, but for the post-prison education program. If you have friends or family in the system, you know the challenges that have become integrated into society after a time in prison. Um, and, and then she closes, if we don't help, who will? Um, and I just thought that was really um, poignant. Uh, a couple, uh, well, actually, August 28th, uh, one of our students who's here tonight um, wrote an email to Jenna Melman and I, who Jenna used to work for the Post Prison Education Program, uh, and she's a counselor at Conseho now, an amazing person. Um, and the student says she had just been reunited with her daughter and given custody. And she says, um, I can't thank you enough for this information. I called immediately and left a, me a message on the voicemail. Uh, and this was talking about treatment for her daughter. Um, I will do everything it takes to get us both the help that is needed, uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, then, and then she goes on and she talks about uh, having lost her daughter 13 years ago when she went to prison. And, and, and she said, I don't want to lose her again, and we'll do everything um, to keep my baby girl, who is not a baby any longer, but a young lady with a lot of hurt and pain inside her. Uh, and then she goes on to um, uh, thank us uh, for helping her reunite with her daughter, uh, who's now living with her in, in Pierce County uh, in court, family court, a couple weeks ago. Uh, the court gave her custody of her 16-year-old daughter. They're living together. And Maria, her daughter, would be here tonight, but she's got her first job right now, so that's pretty cool. And the, the last one I'm going to read to you was a, a couple of years ago, actually last summer, uh, su summer a year ago, we, uh, on May, May 31st, we were advised by DSHS at 618 at night uh, that they were going to not uh, fulfill a promised contract, and we should have gotten the check in the contract that day at the latest. That's what they had told us in writing. And so we ended up uh, almost going under, and uh, 
we also ended up going through a lot of analysis about what we were going to, uh, how we were going to continue to operate. And we went through a lot of debate about whether we would continue to write checks or not, whether we would just mentor uh, former prisoners and direct them to other resources that we hopefully could find from time to time, or whether we would go through the, the hell, really, of, of, of having responsibility for somebody having housing or not uh, on our backs. And uh, uh, we lost uh, uh, a, a key employee of ours in, in that debate. And uh, then I went through a period of analysis uh, wondering whether we could be effective if we didn't write checks for tuition, books, housing, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and there were some students I knew who could not have made it but for our intervention, but there were some I didn't know whether they could or not. So one student who today is in his fourth year of college, he's down at WSU and about to finish his electrical engineering degree, um, I wrote to this guy, Chris Jones, and I asked him, would you have made it if we hadn't written checks? And this is what he said. Um, he says, I have an exam coming up soon, I'll be brief. I think it's very unlikely that I would have made it to the, uh, in the absence of financial support. Financial support was not something I would have received from family or associates either. It simply wasn't there. When you paid my rent soon after I was released or put down a security deposit for the Oxford House, those were pivotal times. Uh, in my gr life, great intentions, in my life, great intentions have been turned into great despair with my numbing speed. I was used to losing. At any point, I may have been close to giving up and admonishing myself to never give in to flights of fancy, like having a life worth living. Then he said, uh, maybe I'm lucky compared to you in this respect. I have never once, I'm sorry for this, I have never once had to wonder about the impact you made in my life, never once. So that's the post-prison education program, and I hope you'll support it. Uh, I just want to tell you about the handouts, because I really do want you to get them. Um, in 1996, 1995, 1996, somebody walked up to me and handed me a GQ magazine. These articles are not online. I personally believe they're not online because of government intervention, but regardless, they're not online. So there's 250 copies of a 1996 article about the murder of, of, of Jesse Trinidad's brother uh, and the 1997 GQ article, and they're down here and they're paper clipped together. Um, and they're a key part of tonight's presentation. Um, several years ago, two women, um, one of two women completed multiple years of being continuously sexually assaulted in the Washington Correction Center for Women outside of Gig Harbor. And she made her way to Columbia Legal Services and to Beth Colgan, uh, and Beth filed a lawsuit um, on behalf of that woman that had just released uh, and one and the, another woman who was still there. Um, just to make, drive home the importance of civil rights litigation, uh, we've got a copy of the actual lawsuit down here on the table, as well as a Seattle Times article. And you ought to pick it up and take it home and, and read about it so that you really uh, understand what can happen from civil rights litigation like Jesse's been pursuing for 15, 16, 17 years. It's, uh, uh, DOC not only had to write a check for a million dollars, but they had to affect remedial action down at the prison, hopefully fix the prison so that those kind of sexual assaults couldn't continue. Um, and the last thing, one of the most courageous things I've ever seen in my life was, <clears throat> was Lizzie Reed standing up in front of four or 500 people at Kane Hall on April 11th and reading this essay, which is down here, which is about her being raped while in prison. Um, and about the fact that the guy who did it uh, was not prosecuted. Uh, it's really interesting to me that Pierce County, as a matter of policy, does not prosecute PREA cases. Uh, and uh, the DOC's investigation was about this far. They called the rapist up, said, did you rape her? He said, no, end of investigation. 
Uh, Don, please turn on the CNN video. Thank you. Americans are taking toward violent criminals these days. With a, a new three strikes and your outlaws and other measures, there's a new national mood to make criminals pay for their acts. But away from the public eye and behind bars, are inmates being forced to pay beyond the intent of the law? There are indications that some inmates are being tortured and even killed. CNN National Correspondent ba Bonnie Anderson is here now to start a series on this entitled Criminal Injustice. Bonnie. Well, every day in America, the FBI investigates allegations of corrections officials abusing inmates. Sometimes the accusations even include murder. Today, we'll look at one such case in Oklahoma City. To friends and family, Kenneth Trenadu was a kind man, who after spending six years in prison for bank robbery, became a hard worker and married a longtime sweetheart in the late 1980s. The couple loved spending time with their nieces and nephews, and finally, earlier this year, had a boy of their own. Kenneth was pleased to have a baby. Uh, he talked about uh, if anybody could teach a child what not to do, he was a person who certainly could do it, and that was his attitude about the baby. But last July, Trenadu was arrested for not reporting to his parole officer. He faced a hearing and, according to his lawyer brother, a few months in prison for the infraction. In an August 17th letter to his wife, Trenadu said he was headed to the Federal Transfer Center in Oklahoma City. Be there 10 to 14 days, he wrote, then on to where I'll be doing my time. On August 19th, he called his family from the prison. He was pretty upbeat. He left a message for his wife through my sister saying, would you please send him a uh, money order? to take care of his personal expenditures until he got through this probation violation hearing. But on August 21st, Kenneth Trentadu was dead. According to the warden, who called the family and sent this follow-up letter, he was found hanging from a light fixture in a single cell used for protective custody inmates. Prison officials believed it was suicide. How can you hang yourself in a security cell when there's not supposed to, there's supposed to be suicide proof? For Trenadu's brother, Jesse, the story did not ring true. I can't understand why he would be asking me to help him get ready for his probation here. One day and then kill himself the next. Trenadu demanded an immediate autopsy, but according to this fax, prison authorities refused, unless Trenadu's ailing mother provided a power of attorney and a letter of consent. This, when federal regulations clearly state a warden may order an autopsy in homicides or suicides with no authorization from the inmates next of kin. And I'm starting to get evasive answers from them. I'm having difficulty getting my brother's body released. It took a week almost to get him home. They'd asked to have him cremated. We said no, we want him home. An autopsy was finally performed. Death by asphyxiation. But all other details would not be revealed until the FBI's investigation is complete. When Trenadu's family got his body home for burial, they were stunned and angry enough to photograph it thoroughly. Prison officials say it was suicide. What do you say? It's a lie. They killed him. Um, the thing that troubles me is why they think they're such fools. Uh, they send my brother's body home. Um, made up so you can't see his injuries and he is beaten to a pulp his head is smashed in his forehead the back of his head his throat's been cut his knuckles are black and swollen he's literally beaten from the top of his head to the soles of his feet he has bruises from fingerprints on his biceps where they held him and they killed him he has shackles marks on his legs where he was chained when they killed him Burns? Burns on his face and his shoulders. Heel marks? He had been stomped. There's a bruise of a heel on his ribs. Uh, the skin is off of his back where they probably, it looks as though they dragged his body after he was dead. Trentadu sent these photos to the warden. On September 1st, 11 days after the death, the prison issued a press release referring to the abrasions and bruises for the first time. Permissible items found in the cell, according to the release, would support presumptions that cuts on the body were self-inflicted. You received his personal effects. What was in them? 
You have uh, a picture of his wife and baby. You have uh, a plastic cup, vitamin pills, soap, toothbrush, comb. Um, nothing that allowed him to do that kind of injury to himself. He has a number of abrasions on his face, around his right eye, and on his forehead. Dr. Steve Dunton, a medical examiner in the Atlanta area, reviewed the photos and videotape of Trentadue's body for CNN. This collection of different injuries, bruises, abrasions, different areas of the body, particularly those in the back of his hands, the back of his arm, I find this to be highly suspicious. They don't appear to be self-inflicted? Most of these, no. I don't see how they could be. In a statement, the FBI in Oklahoma City said, the photographs are very troubling, and we're going to investigate as well as we can and come to a conclusion. Prison officials refuse to speak with CNN and are not cooperating with Trinidad's family, not even to explain why he was in protective custody apart from all other inmates. When Trinidad's wife, mother, and siblings requested a copy of the paperwork he would have had to sign before witnesses in order to request a single cell for security reasons, they were told to file a freedom of information request, and they did. They also asked for photographs of the cell, videotapes from the surveillance cameras routinely used in such facilities, the logbook showing who was on duty when Trenadu died, and the medical reports prisons by law must complete upon an inmate's arrival to document his physical and psychological condition. You wrote to the warden did you get any satisfaction nothing you wrote to the acting warden nothing you wrote to the um regional council for the bureau of prisons nothing you wrote to the person who heads up the bureau of prison nothing you wrote to the to janet reno nothing the bureau of prisons regional council and officials in the washington dc headquarters also refused to speak with cnn citing the ongoing fbi investigation you're grieving but are you also angry I have a rage that you cannot put into words. And I will always be thankful to him for his wounds. He was able to tell us in death that it went a suicide. Why should the public care that a one-time victimizer might have become a victim in prison? I would say that the people who killed my brother represent the United States, and that should scare the hell out of all of us. With the Federal Transfer Center a hub for inmates bound for penitentiaries around the country, FBI agents say it will take time before they can track down prisoners who may have heard or seen what happened. Until then, Trinidad's family will just have to wait for some answers. Now, according to people close to the investigation, prison officials just two weeks ago finally allowed the medical examiner's office into the cell where Trinidad died. Bobby Lee. I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight and thank Ari for having me. This week is the first time in almost 17 years I've looked at that tape. And I think it was more painful than when I watched it the first time. I could not have imagined when that news clip was filmed that it would be the start of a 17-year war with the Department of Justice, a war that I don't see an end to. I look at my wonderful wife and my children and I see what I've missed over the last 17 years in this fight, how distant I've become, how unpleasant to be with on many times. Because early on in this fight, I was consumed with rage and hate. Uh, and I didn't start out to distrust and hate the Department of Justice. They earned that distrust and hate. I didn't start out to solve the Oklahoma City bombing. I didn't start out to expose the corruption on a massive level in the Department of Justice. Things like PatCon, and hopefully we'll get an opportunity to talk here tonight how the FBI especially hides records from defense counsel, evidence from defense counsel, and they have a system for doing it. How they have a system for recruiting and planting informants on the staffs of federal judges, uh, on the staffs of congressmen and senators, even on defense teams and high profile criminal cases. And I wanna to talk to you about what a war like this is about. It's painful to see 
my brother's face again, although that's burned, that image is burned in my brain forever, to see your parents who died during this fight and you had no time to grieve, you just consumed, consumed by the fight. And to talk to you, it is much like a war. You fight these on many fronts. You fight them on a civil front by suing the government. You fight it on a criminal front by trying to have people indicted for the crime. You fight it politically by trying to recruit your congressmen and senators to help you. And lastly, you fight it on the Freedom of Information Act front. And the Freedom of Information Act is a law that Congress passed that says you have a right to demand from federal agencies records. And unless they're protected by a privilege such as national security, national defense, or an ongoing criminal prosecution, they have to give them to you. And I want to talk to you about how this war raged on all of those fronts for 17 years. And the first thing I want to tell you about is my brother being at the transfer center. He came out of the military during the Vietnam War, like lots of folks, boys did. He came out a heroin addict. And he robbed the bank to support it. He was caught. He pled guilty. He went to prison, federal prison. He does his time. He's released in 1987. He has a probation officer that doesn't believe in beer drinking. And Kenny worked construction in Southern California. And I helped him fight that condition of probation and parole. We took it all the way up and lost. So Kenny goes back to his probation officer and says, look, I want to drink beer, so there's no point in me coming in once a month to give a urine test. Uh, come and get me. And they never did. He gets married. 1995, he has a child. His wife is Mexican-American. They have family in Baja, California. He's coming back across the border. He's picked up and sent to Oklahoma City. And at the time, it seemed nothing unusual to me because uh, he said he was going back for a parole hearing, revocation hearing. But now I know the federal judge that convicted him was in San Diego. His probation officer was in San Diego. The judge has to revoke your probation and parole. There was no purpose to be in, in Oklahoma City, but he was. And he arrived on a Friday night. We speak with him on Saturday. He supposedly commits suicide on a Monday. And this is what happened in the civil side of that lawsuit. We didn't start out to sue the government. We started out wanting justice for my brother and some modicum of support for my brother's widow and her little boy. The, they made two attempts to have his body cremated. Once they asked us, we said no, then they go to the medical examiner. He says no, the family has to do that. It's their decision. The logs, everything, that litany of of material I asked for in a Freedom of Information Act request on CNN, the logbooks disappeared. Now the logbooks are maintained at the institution until they're full, and then they're sent to the National Archives. The logbooks that was shown people who had access to my brother either disappeared or the pages from the logs disappeared. The crime scene, the Department of Justice does an investigation. The crime scene photographs disappear. There's a surveillance camera videotape. The FBI says it's blank. I receive a call from a very famous videographer named Norman Pearl, who was the videographer for the uh, uh, Rodney King trial. He says, look, this is strange, I wanted to call you. He said, the FBI brought me a surveillance tape, they brought me a camera, and asked me, was the camera functioning? And I, and I said, they didn't want a report, they wanted an oral report, nothing in writing. He calls them back and says the tape's erased. They immediately show up at his door, they take back the camera, they take back the tape and tell him to keep his mouth shut. He calls me and says, I'll come and testify for you. Shortly before the trial, Pearl's dead of a heart attack. My brother's clothing, he was wearing bloodstained clothing at the time, it's apparent from the photographs we got later, that, and that disappeared, gone. There's supposed to be a, uh, psychological reconstruction done of an inmate suicide in the federal system. The Department of Justice requires it. And the purpose is to see, was it one, a, really a suicide? And two, if it was, what could we have done to prevent this or to alleviate this, this problem? The only inmate suicide in the federal system for which a psychological reconstruction was not done, my brother's case. We get into the civil suit and find out that 41 pieces of evidence disappeared out of the FBI's official file. I say, what was gone? They say, well, not only is the evidence gone, 
but all chain of custody records for that evidence are gone too. What happened to it? We don't know. It's just gone. Had two inmate witnesses, a kid named Nick Acabasso. He supposedly dies of a drug overdose before the trial. Had a witness named Alden Gillis Baker. Both of these men said they could hear the torture and a beating. Baker is in Lompoc. The Department of Justice recruits three inmates to convince him to change his testimony. We attempt to get a protective order for him. The judge won't grant it. Baker hangs himself, according to the Department of Justice, a month before our trial is to start. Before he hanged himself, he contacted the U.S. attorney handling the civil suit and told him about the threats and asked him to stop it. And the U.S. attorney tells him, unless you change your mind, you'll get no help from your testimony, you'll get no help from me, and hung up. That call was recorded. I asked for the tape. The judge won't turn it over. We were able to, and it's unusual to do this, get grand jury testimony of the guards and witnesses who said they saw my brother hanging. And we depose them, and three of them collapse on cross-examination and admit they lied to the grand jury. So I think we've got them now. We'll go to the prosecutors, the U.S. attorney, and say, look, you can charge these guys with perjury, and you can get them to, change, to tell the truth what happened. The Department of Justice goes to a federal judge and gets an order prohibiting me from reporting the crimes, reporting the crimes to the U.S. Attorney and to the Senate Judiciary Committee. Couldn't believe it, but they got that order just like that. We have the Inspector General of the Department of Justice do a multi-year investigation, supposedly, of my brother's murder. It's the only report, I understand, by the Inspector General's office not involving national security that's been sealed. In a civil suit against the United States Department of Justice, it's tried to the court, not the jury. Two weeks before that trial started, the OIG, the Inspector General, sends a copy of that report to the judge and other evidence. I asked for them, <laughs> can't have them. We go to trial anyway. This was in the year 2000. This was a couple month trial in Oklahoma. We end up with a $1.1 million judgment. But it's not for my brother's murder. It's for the intentional infliction of emotional distress upon my family. The Department of Justice tells us, we'll never pay you. And they appeal. The 10th Circuit sends it back. We win again. They appeal again. 10th Circuit sends it back. We win again. They take it up again, and suddenly in 2008, they pay the judgment. Now, they probably thought we'd go away, but that just made us armed and dangerous. And I did a test on that. We put out a $250,000 reward for a year. No one claimed that. Now, that told me this involved more than the guards. The reason if it had been guards, somebody would have come forward to claim that reward. You don't claim that reward because somebody way up the food chain is looking at you, and you're going to pay a price if you do it. And that's, that ended, and I, and I, it was hard to take to have it end like that. No more recourse civilly. And then we tried the criminal route, and it was done in conjunction with the civil suit. We could not get a grand jury convened, so we went and had billboards put up with those horrible pictures of my brother's body on it. Now, we couldn't afford the billboards, but the billboard company said, you provide the, the, the pictures and we'll put them up. In the communities in which those posters and those billboards went up, the city council supported us. A lot of the public complained, said, these are horrible things. We don't want our kids looking at that. And they stood behind us. But key, key to the criminal side of it was the medical examiner, Dr. Fred Jordan. He shows up at that cell that morning to pick up my brother's body, and he demands his investigators access. They tell him no. They get back to the medical examiner's office, and they call the FBI and say, 
preserve that crime scene. The Department of Justice has the cell clean by noon that day. They let Jordan back in in November. He does a luminol test, and that's a test you can put for blood. That you, it's a, a solvent you put on the walls or floor and use a, a blue light, a black light, and where there's blood, it glows. Jordan told me it glowed like a Christmas tree. Jordan's there, they point to a note on the wall and says, it's a suicide note. Jordan says, well, why did he sign his name Tom instead of Kenny? Jordan said, I want the handwriting analyzed. Now Jordan told me that the cell was sealed, said FBI crime scene. He comes back two weeks, two weeks later, the cell's painted. I find out, and again, not all of these things I didn't know at the time, that before the grand jury convened, the deputy attorney general, who was then Jamie Gorlick, convened the meeting with the criminal side out of Maine Justice, who were going to do the grand jury, and the civil lawyers who were going to do the defense of my family's civil suit, which we hadn't filed. And I asked for those records. And the Department of Justice says, work product. Well, work product only applies when you're anticipating a civil suit. There's no way they should have been sitting down with the civil lawyers and the, the prosecutors. And they were all out of Maine justice. Typically, when you have a crime committed, it'll be your local U.S. attorney here that prosecutes it. If there's a civil suit filed, it'll be the local U.S. attorney that defends the United States government. In my brother's case, time after time after time, it's Maine justice lawyers. I find out that the first thing they did was go to the armed forces pathologist, a man named Gormley, and ask him, he's the chief pathologist for the military, will you come to Oklahoma City and testify that this is a suicide? He said, he'll know. In fact, he called me and told me what they'd done. He said, this man's been murdered. I find out before the grand jury, they don't tell the grand jury that the FBI crime lab had found somebody else's blood in the cell. Don't bother to have it tested. They claim Kenny had been hanging by a bed sheet and been cut down. It was a braided bed sheet ligature, according to the FBI. The crime lab said it hadn't been cut. They don't tell the, the grand jury about that or the medical examiner. Kenny had called when he was in Oklahoma and he'd spoken to my wife and she said, how'd you get to Oklahoma? And he said, it's that jet age thing. And he went on to explain how that, that's why they fly prisoners, where they fly prisoners around the country. And they altered that transcript of the call to say it's that AIDS thing and tell the grand jury that my brother had AIDS and that's probably why he killed himself. Jordan was an ally and this video was shot. Now bear in mind that Fred Jordan was the key witness for the government, one of the key witnesses in the bombing case. My brother was killed shortly after the bombing. He's handling the bomb, Oklahoma City bombing case. He's handling my brother's murder. And this is an interview he gave in July of 1997. This is KOKH-TV, Oklahoma City. From Fox 25, this is the 9 o'clock news. I've made a lot of people very angry at me, and you know, that's just a shame. Because I am trying to protect the public safety here, and it's just, it's just too bad. That's the way it's going to have to be. Fred Jordan, the state's chief medical examiner, speaks out in anger about the mysterious death of Kenneth Michael Trenadu, a Fox 25 News exclusive. And good evening, I'm Kirsten McIntyre. And I'm Damon Gardenhire, and for Jack Bowen, tonight a major development in an ongoing Fox 25 News investigation. The state's chief medical examiner says it's taking too long to find out what really happened to an inmate who died inside Oklahoma City's Federal Transfer Center nearly two years ago. And tonight, Fred Jordan is demanding the local bombing grand jury investigate the mysterious death of Kenneth Michael Trinidou. Fox 25's Phyllis Williams has been following this case for more than a year now. Phyllis Jordan really rarely gives interviews. Why is he doing it today? Well, Damon, he says he's simply fired up and he wants action. Jordan says if Kenneth Michael Trinidou was murdered or if anybody else is murdered at the Federal Transfer Center, the public has the right to know. But Jordan says that's not happening. Do you believe he was murdered? I think it's very likely he was murdered. I'm not able to prove it. I have, cl I have temporarily classified the death as undetermined. Uh, you see a body covered with blood, removed from the room, as Mr. Trentadue was, 
soaked in blood, covered with bruises, and you try to gain access to the scene and the government of the United States says, no, you can't. They continued to prohibit us from having access to the scene of his death, which is unheard of in 1997, until about five months later, we went in there and luminoled, and it lit up like a candle because of the blood still present on the walls of the room after four or five months. But at that point, we have no scene. We have no crime scene. So the, there are questions about the death of Kenneth Trentadu that will never be answered because of the actions of the United States government. Whether those actions were intentional or whether they were through incompetence, I don't know. And it's not easy to communicate with the federal government. It was botched. Or worse, it was planned. Why is there a problem? Is there a well, problem? Well, you tell of me. Too? You tell me why there's a problem. Is there a problem? Could it be because the family will not let this go? Would you, if it were your relative? There are some people who would question why you're why you feel so strong about this case because after all, they go, well, it's just an inmate. It's not just an inmate. Mr. Trentadu might be somebody I wouldn't let in my house. But let me tell you something. He's a human being, or was a human being. And I'm not saying I like these guys. I'm not saying I wouldn't be terrified if you put me out there with them. But I'm saying that they're our responsibility. And I'm saying that the investigation of their deaths is my responsibility as long as I'm chief medical examiner. And damn it, I'm going to do it. Regardless of what I have to do. Now, the other, the other thing is, do you think that the prison system, uh, do you think that the court system is so accurate and so effective that there is no one in jail that's innocent? If you do, I have a piece of shore property just outside of El Reno, I want, to, I want to sell you it. I think that we need an Oklahoma County grand jury made up of Oklahoma County citizens in which the U.S. Attorney for the Western District of Oklahoma, Mr. Ryan, can participate where the people in Washington cannot forbid him to do that, uh, that he can, he can participate in our investigation as an Oklahoman, as somebody concerned about our city. Can we try contacting Reno? Oh, yes. Hatch? Yes, I have. And what's happening? Yes, I have. Let me tell you about that. Back when we were still investigating the bombing, because Mr. Trinidad died shortly after the bombing, I, the medical examiner for the state in which the Murrah building bombing occurred, made a call one day to Mrs. Reno's office. I told them who I was, and I said I would like to speak to an assistant U.S. attorney. I was told... You can't. None is available. But the door has been shut from Ms. Reno's office to me as the chief medical examiner forever. But you will fight for this county grand jury that's oh, yes. looking at yes, the I bombing to look at... Yes, I will. And if that doesn't happen, I'll continue to fight in any way I possibly can. My job as chief medical examiner is, among other things, to investigate deaths that occur in prison. Well, Jordan also wants the local bombing grand jury to tour the Federal Transfer Center and see if it's possible for an inmate to hang himself, as the FTC officials claim. And, Damon, there is a new law that was signed in February that would give the medical examiner immediate access to a death scene at the Federal Transfer Center. But Jordan says that the feds are trying to block that. What they want him to do is have access if only if they say the death is suspicious. All right. Good job, Phyllis. Stay on it for us. Kirsten? And Jesse Trinidou, Michael Ken uh, Michael's brother, uh, and his family have been waging a war to find out what really happened at the FTC for nearly two years now. Jesse Trinidou, who is a Salt Lake City attorney, says Jordan's efforts may be what's needed to finally get the truth out. I think he senses and has experienced the same frustrations we have. To have been lied to, uh, to have evidence destroyed, uh, witnesses threatened, uh, witnesses hidden. Uh, the actions of the United States Department of Justice in this matter stink. Jesse Trinidou has appeared before the federal grand jury. He and his family have been complaining, campaigning throughout the country, even bringing their concerns to Capitol Hill. So the very latest tonight in the Trinidou case, Chief Medical Examiner Fred Jordan is asking that the bombing grand jury be allowed to look into the case. A federal grand jury has been investigating Trinidou's death for the past nine months but so far no action has been taken. The Senate Judiciary Committee as well as Amnesty International are now involved in the case and Trinidou, the Trinidou family has filed a federal lawsuit against the FBI, the Bureau of Prisons, and the Justice Department. This was Jordan in July of 97. Shortly after that interview, he calls me up and he says, I'm going to change the manner of death to suicide 
you've got 15 minutes to convince me not to. And I said to him, Dr. Jordan, the lawsuit has just started. I'm going to find the evidence. Don't do this. And he hung up the phone and changed it to suicide. I talked to his staff sometime later, and they said before doing that, he'd been visited by two FBI agents who had removed him from the medical examiner's office, brought him back several hours later. He was white as a sheet, and he went and made the call to me. There went the criminal prosecution. But I still, my family, we still had hopes about political because a very powerful senator was my senator, and I knew him, Orrin Hatch. And I thought he was the chairman of the Judiciary Committee. And this is an interview Hatch gave in October of 97. And he gave this interview after the grand jury had concluded. It had been, the conclusion had been announced as a no bill. The grand jury had actually concluded on August the 1st, 1997. When it happened, though, there was a meeting by then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder and Stuart Margulies and other high-ranking staff members from, the, from Attorney General Reno's staff. And it was what Holder coined the Trinidad mission. And the subject was, how are we going to handle the release of this no bill on indictment for Kenneth Trinidad's murder? And they put together a plan. And Hatch, not to deal with Hatch, they said, Hatch is crucial. We've got to deal with Hatch on this. Got to muzzle him. And we've got to do all these other things. And one of the other things they did is they did a videotape of a reenactment of my brother's suicide, send it to all the national media. Holder refers to it in his staff as Trinidus, meaning things to do, and Trinidons, meaning we don't want to do these things. But the crucial one was Hatch, Hatch, Hatch. And this is Hatch's statement to the press when the news of the no bill was announced at the end of October of 1997. What's your reaction to the uh, letter from the Justice Department that they walked away from the country? Well, I've been somewhat surprised by it, uh, both surprised and unsurprised. The fact is, is, that, is that they have not found any criminal uh, liability here. On the other hand, they can't explain the tremendous inconsistencies of what happened in this particular instance, so I'm very concerned about it. They have left it open for the state to determine whether or not there has been criminal activity and whether or not people need to be indicted. But their own investigation did not disclose that, according to them. I met with the Deputy Attorney General just last night on this. So you've seen the pictures uh, and the information of the case. How could there be no federal crime wrongdoing in the death of Trent? Well, it wasn't just pictures. It was the finding of blood, the inconsistencies with regard to the death, the, the way the matter was, was covered up, really, the lack of proof that he really did harm to himself. Uh, all of this is very, very uh, upsetting to a lot of people, including myself. Now, we haven't held a hearing on this uh, in, uh, lately because of the ongoing federal investigation. But now that the general people have completed their analysis of this and their investigation, I think we will hold a hearing between now and the end of the year and just see what we can do to get to the bottom of this. Is there anything further that you can do besides hold a hearing? Not a lot. <clears throat> Not a lot. Uh, we, we've pushed uh, the FBI and the uh, Justice Department as far as we can push them. Now what we've got to do is push them through hearings and see what happens there. But it still doesn't mean that, uh, you know, that justice won't be done in this case because the state, <coughs> certainly the state is looking into it and may very well decide more has to be done. In uh, December, you told Attorney General <coughs> Janet Reno that it looked like this was murder, if you still believe that Trinidad was murder. Well, I don't know that I ever went that far, but it certainly looks terrible. And it certainly makes one wonder whether or not the murder was committed or a manslaughter. Uh, it certainly has a lot of elements of, of, uh, of uh, questionability. And uh, if you look at all the facts, the body, they tried to cremate the body before anybody could see that that body was bruised and battered. Uh, the blood that was found, the lack of uh, following procedures, I mean, just on and on. Uh, there's a lot wrong with this case, and I hope somebody will get to the bottom of it. But 
apparently the federal government hasn't been able to do so. Well, if, if the feds can't make a case for something that happened in their institution and this man was in their custody with their people, what chance does the state have to make it? I think it's very difficult for the state to do it. Uh, but nevertheless, they may have some ways of doing it because uh, there were state people who who uh, may have been involved, especially from the standpoint of uh, following up on what happened. Well, if indeed the state does make a case in this incident, this crime, if they find it to be what occurred on federal property, is it not thus a federal crime? Could be, and if they can make the case, we may. Uh, I'm sure the Justice Department will revisit it. Uh, I, I was disappointed in, the, in these findings. There's just, there are just too many unexplained facts, too much brutality uh, apparently done, and uh, and frankly no answers. And I can't understand that. Well, does it have the aroma of cover-up? Yep, it has the aroma of cover-up. You talked about holding a hearing. Will your committee have full access to the Oklahoma federal grand jury's findings? Can I say that again? You talked about having a hearing um, in this session. Will your committee have full access to the Oklahoma federal grand jury's findings? No, uh, we can't get into grand jury matters. See, that's one of the problems we've had, is that they always hide behind the grand jury. And when I say cover-up, I'm not saying necessarily by the Justice Department. I don't think they would cover it up, but I, it, it certainly looks like a cover-up from the beginning of this thing. And uh, somebody, uh, somebody other than trying to do beat himself up. You know, beat trying to do up. Uh, the injuries that he suffered on his body do not appear to have been self-inflicted. Neither does uh, the actuality of his death. Will the uh, subcommittee investigating the FBI crime lab also look into the handling of evidence in this case? I don't know. We'll have to see. Uh, I think the regular hearing will go into what they did and what they failed to do. So we'll get into that regardless, and it'll probably be a full committee hearing unless, uh, unless we assign it to one of the subcommittees. Do you think what's going on here is a parsing of words? They're not saying a crime wasn't committed and we just can't prove it? I think that's basically it. They're, they, just, they just don't have the evidence to show who, who did this if anybody did it. And uh, they themselves admit that uh, it's a very, very uh, serious set of problems and very strange circumstances and the facts uh, militate that somebody's responsible here other than just plain trying to do it. And uh, yet uh, they haven't been able to find out who or what caused this, uh, this particular problem. What about as far as the former inmates who have come forward in the case and now say that their lives are being threatened and one has even been sent back into the federal system because he traveled across lines from Arkansas to Oklahoma to tell his story? Uh, to the Oklahoma County DA, Bob Macy, what he saw the night Trinidad died. Um, he said that he saw an officer cleaning bloody batons the night that Trinidad died. Your comments on that? don't know much about that. haven't been into that, but uh, that's, serious. that's serious stuff. And uh, like I say, it does look bad. Somebody has not told the truth here, and somebody is, is uh, in my opinion, covering up. And, uh, you know, I wish that wasn't the case. And I'd love to have it proven that it wasn't the case, but I think it's a pretty uphill battle to prove that that, uh, that uh, nothing happened here other than trying to do self-infliction. Uh, that, that, that doesn't look possible to me under the facts that I've seen. So I'm very concerned about it. I just, I just, uh, it just appears to be a tremendous injustice as we sit here right now. Certainly not the Justice Department. Orrin Hatch promised a hearing, it doesn't take place. He's repeatedly visited by Eric Holder, disappears off of the political spectrum. And it was about several years after this, well, I guess a year before and several years after this that we launched that FOIA front. And it started in December or January, uh, December of 1995 or January 1996. And this was back before uh, caller ID on phones. And I get a telephone call in December. And the caller says, I want you to know your brother was murdered by the FBI. It was a case of mistaken identity. It was an interrogation that went bad. And I said, what do you mean? They said, well, they suspected him of being part of a, a group who were robbing banks to get money to fund attacks on the federal government. And I dismissed that. And then I 
In June or July of 96, I read an article in the paper about a fellow named Richard Lee Guthrie. It was in the Los Angeles Times, who hanged himself, supposedly, while in federal custody. The day before he'd promised to give the Los Angeles Times an interview, he said, would blow the lid off the Oklahoma City bombing. I didn't pay much attention to that either. And then shortly before his death, I get a message from Timothy McVeigh. And McVeigh said, when I saw your brother's photograph and I heard what happened to him, I want you to know that I believe he was killed by the FBI because they thought he was Richard Lee Guthrie. And I didn't, you know, I, I honestly, I didn't think that much about it. But what did focus me was a phone call I received in 2003 from a reporter now dead, a great guy named J.D. Cash. And he called me up and he said, are you Jesse Trinidad? And I said, yes. And he said, can I talk to you? And I said, of course. He said, let me ask some questions about your brother. He said, how tall was he? I said, he was about five foot eight. JD said, what was his build? I said, about, he was a powerfully built man. He was about 180 pounds. JD said his complexion. I said, he was dark complected then. JD said, uh, where was he arrested? I said, he was coming back across the border from Mexico visiting his wife's family. J.D. said, what was he driving? I said, and his friend's 1986 Chevrolet pickup truck. J.D. said, did he have any tattoos? I said, yeah. J.D. said, what kind and where? I said, he had a dragon tattoo on his left forearm. J.D. said, you better sit down. I said, hell, I am sitting down. He said, let me tell you this. He said, at the time your brother was picked up and killed, the largest manhunt in American history was taking place for John Doe II, and this is the description, white male, Powerful upper body build, five foot eight to five foot nine, dark complected, believed to be in Canada or Mexico, driving mid 1980s Chevrolet pickup truck, dragon tattoo, left forearm. Turns out one other person had that description too, and that was Richard Lee Guthrie. So now I had a motive, and I decided, how am I going to prove it? And I decided through Freedom of Information Act. I had been leaked and I don't want to run a step over my time here, but I'd been leaked two teletypes from FBI director at that time, Louis Free. And they talked about this white supremacist compound in eastern Oklahoma called Elohim City and how McVeigh had called there several times before the bombing asking for more help. So I filed a Freedom of Information Act request for all documents linking Elohim City to the Oklahoma City bombing and in McVeigh through FBI informants. Well, people say, how can you fight the FBI? They're so big and so powerful, the federal government. I had one real advantage. The FBI will always lie. It will lie when the truth would serve the Bureau better. So I knew they would come back and say, there are, there are no such teletypes. And that's what they did. And I knew also, that when I sprung those teletypes on them in front of the federal judge, they'd come back and say they were fake. So I had an affidavit from a retired FBI agent out of the headquarters saying, no, they were real. So I filed the teletypes. They come back in front of the federal judge and says, oh, those are fraudulent. I file the affidavit. The judge goes ballistic. He says, I want you to go back and do another search. And he says to me, where should they look? And by that time, I had discovered by doing the research on the FBI that they had started out in the 80s with what they called the June file. Any evidence or materials they didn't want produced on a Freedom of Information Act request or turned over to defense counsel in criminal trials went into the June file. Well, they were found out. So then they invented the zero file. Well, they were found out about that too. And then I found out they had an eye drive. And an I drive is where they put all the evidence before it's put, uploaded into the official file. And they make the decision as to what is uploaded into the official file. And that's the file given to defense counsel, and that's the file they search for responses to Freedom of Information Act requests. I say to the judge, have them go search the I drive. And then I found out they'd replace that with an S drive. So, and they've got 24 more letters in the alphabet to go, but they went and searched that, and they come back in front of the judge, and they said, we've got 340 pages of documents. And they say to him, we can't turn these over, Your Honor, because we had five or six informants there, and their lives will be in jeopardy. And the judge says, 
no, no, turn them over. You can black the names out. And it turns out that the earliest record starts two hours after the bombing in Oklahoma City. And I go back in front of the judge and I say, oh, that's not, that's not possible. That's not possible. And meanwhile, I'd gotten in to see uh, Terry Nichols and he had given me a lot of information about the bombing. And he wanted the story told. And I go in front of the judge and said, I want uh, permission and order from you to go take his deposition and videotape it. The judge says, you've got it. The FBI scurries to the 10th Circuit and gets him reversed. But what was important about that was the information about the I drive and S drive. And then I stumbled onto something called PATCON, P-A-T-C-O-N. And these are on the internet now because for my own safety, I made sure that they were out there as quickly as I got them. And PATCON stood for Patriot Conspiracy. And it looked really big. They talked about PATCON Group 1, PATCON Group 2, PATCON Group 3, and the FBI is backpedaling. I say, oh no, these were just some good old boys down in Alabama who stole some night vision goggles and we went into the sting operation to get them. But last summer, 2011, I get a phone call from a fellow named John Matthews. And Matthews tells me, you've got all the pieces, but you haven't put it together. And I said, what do you mean? He said, Pat Conn. He said, I'll come and see you. So he came to Utah to see me. And he's an old veteran of the 3rd Marine Division, like me. And he's very sick with Agent Orange. And he had been one of their top operatives in Pat Conn for a decade, throughout the 90s. And he said, I went underground for the FBI because I believed it was right to monitor these hate groups. Unlike lots of people who are informants because they're caught in a crime and then uh, are forced to do it. He said, but now I look back on my life and he said, I want the American people to know what was really done. He said, it wasn't to monitor them. He said, it was to infiltrate and incite. I said, what do you mean, John? He said, Ruby Ridge was a PATCON operation. Waco was a PATCON operation. He thought Oklahoma City was, but he couldn't prove it. He couldn't swear to it because he wasn't there, but the people he worked with were there. And he had the documents. PATCON involved a plan to blow up the Browns Ferry nuclear plant in Alabama. It involved running guns out of the same gun store in Arizona that's part of Fast and Furious. And I say to him, I say, John, you want this story told, I can't do it, but I know somebody who can. And so I connected him with an editor at Newsweek. And they're crazy about the story. They spend four months, they confirm everything he said. He's got the FBI records. The story's gonna run the last Monday in November of 2011. I get a call from the reporter at Newsweek that Thursday before to read me the story. It's gonna be 10, eight to 10 pages long. It's gonna talk about the Browns Ferry plant. It's gonna talk about Ruby Ridge. It's gonna talk about Waco. It's gonna talk about the gun store in Fast and Furious. The story comes out on Monday, not a mention of PatCon. Gone. I go back to the reporter, and I go back to John, and John's upset. He said, I, I exposed myself, my family put my family at risk to come out and tell this story, and this, this is what they've done. All they did was talk for eight pages how, what a hero he had been by infiltrating the Klan and all of these other hate groups. But what came out of that and again, as a freedom of it looked like a dead end, the Freedom of Information Act fight again, I stumbled on to the fact that the FBI was not only doing it, but had a manual for recruiting and placing informants on the staffs of federal judges, on the staffs of congressmen and senators, among the clergy and local law enforcement. Uh, in uh, media, and even in other federal agencies. And I couldn't believe this, so I've, I've filed a Freedom of Information Act request for it, and they go, hell yeah, we got the manual. Here's 205 pages of it, but you can't have the rest. Cause it's national security, or it will reveal our policies and procedures. Now that one, that fight hasn't gone critical yet. It's not yet in the courts. But something tells me I might win that one. I can't imagine a federal judge is going to say to them, oh yeah, you can keep secret your policies and procedures for putting informants on my staff. But it was the arrogance with which they told me that. And the arrogance was they said, yeah, well, here's, what we, here's our manual we use for all of these things, but you can't have it all. Now, my time is about there, and I, I know a lot of people here are skeptical. 
the story sounds fanciful. It sounds like somebody who's bitter towards the government, and I am. I'll be the first to admit that. Uh, but it didn't start out that way. Uh, but I would tell you this. There's a document, usually a contemporaneous FBI document, to support, and I've got, and I put them out there, that support everything almost I told you here today. And what I'd like to show you now is the proof beyond any doubt of my brother's murder, proof that we didn't get from the FBI until it was too late, proof that didn't come until a grand jury had found no crime, proof that didn't come until after the judge had found no murder, proof after they muzzled Hatch. And these are photographs of the ligature mark on my brother's throat. The next photograph is the or a horrible one to say, I should say. In life, your skin has elasticity. So if you wear a watch band and you take it off and you see the impression of the watch, it disappears in a few seconds. If you take off your socks, you'll have a ring around your feet. And that'll disappear, your ankles, in a few seconds. When you're dead, your skin does not have elasticity. This, the FBI claimed my brother hanged himself with a braided bed sheet rope. This is the literature mark. These cross striations you see there, looks like a railroad track. Those are the, from the locking mechanism on plastic handcuffs. They beat him, they tortured him, strangled him. And so, you ask me how long I want to fight the son of bitches? Until I'm dead. And what justice do I get out of that? Will they ever prosecute anybody for my brother? No, never will. But I can harm the reputation of the Department of Justice. I can harm the reputation of the FBI. I can do great damage to them. And that's my objective. That's the only justice my family will ever get. Thank you for having me. Ari did introduce our panel earlier, but he has also asked that each uh, guest on the panel tell us why they're here tonight uh, briefly. So can we start with you, Mark? Well, I don't want to, uh, I'm just a law professor and a dean. I think you're going to have a lot more interesting reasons than mine. But I'll tell you my reasons. Uh, I work at a law school uh, that started out as a law school in Tacoma that was designed to be a place uh, to educate people to be lawyers who weren't the traditional uh, sort of common examples of people ended up being lawyers, people straight out of prestigious colleges or whatever it was, but really was dedicated to providing an alternate uh, avenue uh, to have people get a legal education. And part of the reason to do that is to have people from different backgrounds, different perspectives, uh, enter into the legal system so that they can address some of the inherent injustice in the system in different ways than sort of their, your regular people might. Uh, and that was one thing when I heard about the law school that really um, inspired me. And in terms of educating uh, people in a, a post-conviction or a post-incarceration setting, uh, the law school down at UPS and now up at Seattle U has educated scores of former inmates, scores of people with uh, criminal records. Uh, and there's nothing we're more proud of as an institution than our ability to take folks who have been in that kind of position uh, and help them to get to a place where they can be productive uh, and make a difference in the same justice system that uh, had victimized them in the ways that it had. So for me to be able to be involved in a school that has done that and continues to do that makes me very proud and makes me care very much about this stuff. Uh, now that our law school is at Seattle U, Seattle U is a Jesuit school, as many of you know, uh, and the Jesuit schools are committed to uh, achieving social justice. And notwithstanding the kind of things you hear about Christianity at uh, Republican National Conventions, uh, if you actually read uh, what Jesus talked about, um, you'll hear a lot of things that relate to the very sort of things that we're talking about today and the very sort of things that these organizations are working towards. When asked uh, how you can best, how someone could best make sure that they achieved eternal life, Jesus said, uh, if you feed the poor, if you uh, heal the sick, and if you visit the prisoners. Uh, Jesus Christ didn't say very many words, or there aren't very many words in the Bible that he talks about, but one of them is that one of the best ways to achieve salvation is to visit prisoners and to try to help them and to work for them. 
And so as a member of a Jesuit institution, I'm very proud to have that tradition, that religious tradition, inform the kind of social justice work that we do. Uh, and I really will shut up. I'm a law professor. I get paid to talk. So, but uh, I'm also, and it's interesting, I'm going to, definitely Jesse's going to get annoyed with me over the years because I'm actually working on a law review article uh, right now on uh, civil liability of governmental officials for wrongful convictions. And I think I'm going to add to that uh, civil liability for uh, wrongful injuries and, and killings. Uh, and so I got a, uh, an additional chapter to my paper. So that's one reason for me to be here. Again, I'm an academic. That's the kind of things we think about. But I'm going to shut up and let folks that are much more integrally involved in this sort of work talk. But I couldn't be more proud to be here. And I, couldn't, I can't think of a better thing for someone involved in social justice work to be doing. So thank you. Jesse, I feel like we know why you're here, so <laughs> you, can, you can pass to your right if you like. <laughs> well, I, w I was pleased to be asked to speak tonight, um, but on the other hand, I was reticent because I do criminal work. I don't do a lot of the civil work that you've heard Mr. Trenadu talk about. Um, but then, I, thinking about this, I realized that there really is a message that I want to leave you all with, and that is that the, the criminal work that I do as a defense attorney, whether it's on the smallest misdemeanor case or a large, serious federal case or a state-level felony, this happens. And it is, over the years, I have been continually surprised at what I have discovered in the course of investigating my cases. And recently, I've come to start training other lawyers. Um, and, and one of the trainings that I do is on working with their clients and developing relationships with their clients. Another training that I do is on investigation and building a case through use of the, the Public Records Act and subpoenas of government records. And what I tell the, the lawyers that I train in this process is, if your client's telling you that they suspect something, believe them. That's the first step, is to believe that it's possible. And then the second step is to start asking questions. And the third is to know, to have confidence. I think that the Trenadu case is a prime example of this. To have confidence that if you give the government a chance to screw up or to lie about it, they probably will take that opportunity. And I, I am continually amazed at the ways that those truths come out in either small or big ways in my criminal case. But what's frustrating to me as a criminal defense attorney is that even when that truth comes out, it only changes things in a small way. I can get the charges against my client dismissed, but I can't make the big changes. It doesn't restore the harm that's caused to my clients. It doesn't make the big policy changes. Lots of times, unless some news anchor or some news cameraman captures the misconduct on their video and they share it, you're not going to know about it and it's not going to result in DOJ investigations. And that's why the civil work is so important. And there really is a dearth of attorneys out there who will take these cases. And that's partly because, as the Trenadu case is another example, it is so hard and there is so much work that goes into it, but it is such an important part of us being an informed citizenry of us being a safe people, and of us making sure that our government is really working for us. I am here because of many things. The assault that happened to me when I was in prison for growing marijuana did me in for a few years after that, and I really struggled. Um, when I finally met Mr. Ari Cohn in the post-prison education program, everything kind of changed for me because I saw somebody just giving their all, fighting the types of injustices that I'd always accepted as, that's how it's gonna be. 
Um, when I got to know him even more, it was, it just changed me. I went to school, I started learning, and somewhere along the line I decided I'm going to be one of those that go to law school that will take these kind of cases. I don't want to be known as, oh, that's the girl that got raped by a guard while she was in custody. I want to be known as the girl who spoke out and went on to change that for those that came after her. So that's why I'm here. We're very honored to have all of you here tonight. Uh, certainly this is a uh, heinous and upsetting case, uh, not just for the initial crime that was committed here, but I find it as upsetting in terms of what has happened since. The failure for there to be any satisfaction of closure within this, uh, even recognition of what happened. Um, Jesse, I have to ask you, and, and you, you touched upon it right at the end, is there anything that could happen at this point that would constitute justice? in your mind as we know it. it? It never will, because the government decides to prosecute or not to prosecute, and the Department of Justice will never prosecute anybody in this case. It will open too many doors. So there is no, there is no possible satisfactory outcome? No. Mark, as, a, as somebody who teaches law and, and, and theoretically believes in the ideal of law and justice to some extent, and you hear all of this, what, what do you think you can do? What can be done in this situation? Oh, God, I don't know. I don't know what can be done in this particular case. I think Jesse knows better than anybody else the limitations of getting some relief here and has been working on it for uh, much of his life. Uh, I think what I've worked on as a legal scholar is trying to address the, the sort of unfounded and really ridiculous um, immunities that apply to um, law enforcement officials in civil cases. I, unlike, I'm actually, was a civil attorney and do my work in the civil area, and it is true that it's almost impossible to sue government officials for anything from uh, a, a tort like setting a fire in the wrong place that burns down your house all the way up to these horrible, heinous crimes. And the limitations are based on this notion that if you allow for uh, liability for government officials to arise out of a civil lawsuit, that they won't be able to zealously and appropriately uh, perform their duty, uh, that they will be hindered and they will be, feel restricted to perform those duties based on the fear of, oh, if I do this, I might get sued. Uh, and as a former d attorney in the Civil Division of the Department of Justice, I understand that basic perspective. But the reality is in cases like this and a million other cases every year that get dismissed early, uh, there's no incentive like that. The incentive is very much the other way. What you want to have government officials think is, I better not torture this guy because if I do, I might actually be subject to some sort of civil liability. And that's the way it's going to change. The way our justice system works is that people are scared of the consequences of the justice system. If we create a structure where there are no consequences for governmental officials, unless they happen to be videotaped by somebody walking down the street and somebody actually sees what they're doing or some other process, then they're going to act with impunity and that's when government becomes abusive. So the way to change it is to change this, these structures that apply, these immunities that apply, and allow government officials to be subject to lawsuits like Jesse's and really hundreds of thousands of others throughout the country every year uh, that are dismissed at an early stage because of these ridiculous immunities. And that's what I've been writing about for 10 years and have new inspiration to write about again tonight. And are you suggesting that because of things like supremacy clause immunity and, and the like that uh, there really are no possible consequences for people in those agencies? It's very limited. I mean, I, it, certainly there are examples all the time of civil judgments uh, against government officials. Jesse received one, that's one example. They're very rare. The problem is they're way too rare. Uh, they require way too much sort of uh, fortuitous information being provided. If you look at any of these cases, it's always based on somebody was a whistleblower or somebody had saw this and through the normal structure of the process, it almost never happens that you get this liability. And the liability is so rare, it creates no disincentive to do the work. Someone might know that one in a million cases might result in liability, but if that's the odds, no one's ever going to stop doing the things that they shouldn't be doing based on that fear. And, you know, we like to think that people do things based on good motives and, and 
Uh, and certainly people do. There are great people working in government uh, offices, great police, great people all over the country. That's not the point. The point is our justice system is based on the notion that there are lots of people out there that need negative incentives to prevent them from doing problematic things. And if you don't have any, if you have a case like this where everybody involved has received no real consequences for their actions, then there's no disincentive uh, to do those things again. Jesse, the, the case with your brother spans multiple administrations at, at this point. Is corruption a bipartisan or nonpartisan issue? I thought about that, and I think I've concluded that it's a part of, it's due to the fact that the United States is a three-party system. You have Democrats, you have Republicans, you have the third party, which is the permanent party. And the permanent party are the higher-ups in the agencies like the FBI and the ATF that don't change when the administrations change. They're there for decades. They set the policies. They run those agencies, not the president. Kim, Kim, you mentioned that if you give the government time, though, they will screw up or lie. <laughs> uh, how do we take advantage of their, their tendency to do that? Well, you have to have the proof of the lie first. Right. And you set them up. But otherwise, there's a tendency of, of courts to believe the government. Uh, unless you've got the proof that they're lying, nine times out of 10, the, the hard proof, the court is gonna side with the government. Kim, do, do, I, I mean, I have been privy to some of the work you've done uh, on behalf of clients, and I'm really impressed with your dedication to them. Uh, do you consider yourself unusual in, in that sort of stick to and, and loyalty? To to my family? No, I was asking Kim. Oh, excuse Kim, me. Kim. Uh, I don't know. It's I can tell you it's the thing that gets me up in the morning. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's it, and I it, it ties in with something that I wanted to add to what the the dean was saying about one of the answers and what what he had said is we need to change we need to create an opportunity for us to hold them accountable, to reduce some of the immunity, to give them the negative incentives. But the other side of this is the same thing that motivates me. We need to recognize the humanity in the people that are brought into the criminal justice system. And again, whether it is someone who has just been stopped but isn't even arrested, and who is propositioned by a police officer who later lies about it. This is a case that's in my office. Whether it's someone who was watching an officer assault a drunk man who was leaving a bar at night and had the audacity to take out his camera and take a picture, and he wound up beaten in jail. This is a case that has come through my office. Or whether it is cover-ups in a federal case. Um, it all comes back to people believing that the people that they come into contact with don't matter. They can get away with it. They are their property. And there's a lot of things that we do as a society that support that, that buy into that. And until we keep taking a stand against that and showing that they have, have value, I, I think that we're not gonna get the complete solution. And so it's really because of that that I do what I do, and it, it gives me great satisfaction. And I think that's why I, I've been able to get some of the results that I have. But when I, hear, when I hear stories of conspiracies like this, I am initially skeptical, not because I don't believe people do bad things, but because I want to believe more in the humanity of all the other folks who must have been involved in covering something up. I, I believe in the humanity of prisoners and people who are accused. What about the humanity of those who go along with the lie? How do we explain that? Well, I think that there is a huge, there's a pressure. Um, the, 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 the blue code. Uh, it, when you are a part of these institutions, law enforcement, a part of, uh, uh, in, the, in the prisons, being a guard, it is a mentality that you are trained to have. 
that you were promoted for, and lots of times it's hard to fight against. And I really don't want to leave people with the impression that everyone is bad or there aren't people that have good motives going through this. But I think that because we so long have had systemic, you know, this is the way the system views people and trains the people that are in charge to believe and to act and rewards them for that, that it, it really creates a disincentive for them to treat people that way. Have you seen that from the inside, Lizzie? Is that the way you feel, that there is a, a different sort of code that guides the, the, the people who are the guards and the law enforcement and, and those within the prison? Definitely. They have their own subculture, and even if one of, it's very rare that one will speak out against another, even if they see them doing something wrong. They actually got pretty lucky in the one sex abuse lawsuit because one guard did complain about one of the gentlemen that ended up being sued. And, but that's rare. It's, it, they stick together and they're, they have like leaders and followers in there and the strongest one is who the others follow. And there's a definite problem the way they treat inmates in custody. It, it's, it's horrible. I mean, they, they're so angry inside. They hate you so much that it just taints everything, everything in there. It, it takes a lot to get through it and come out and not feel that small by the time. It's not like we don't know we messed up. We know, you know, we know. We sit there and think about it all day long. So we don't need to be beaten down and it, nobody can really be harder on me than myself, but I don't need any additional beating down when I'm already that low. They should be trying to help support any positive changes you're trying to seek out and they just laugh at you. What do you need school for? You're just gonna get out and do the same thing. You know, we'll see you back here. It's just, it's constant. But it's a, it's a subculture, same as with the police on the streets. What, you know, there have been a lot of psychological studies done in terms of how power corrupts quickly in terms of, you know, like right. making one group the, the, the prisoners and the other group the guards. Uh, what I hope you could shed some light on is when one group takes that power role, what does it do to your personal mindset as somebody in custody? How does that impact you? You already said that you felt guilty and were right. self-flagellating, but when you get that constantly from another source, what does it do to you? That's re it's really hard because you feel like they're trying to break you and wear you down. And usually by the time you get to prison, you're already broken. You're already worn down. So they're just heaping more misery on you. Um, you feel very powerless. And I had said before, I thought I, my life, I had you know, a difficult, difficult life with abuses and childhood situations in our family. So I'd always thought I knew what it felt like to not be in control. And it wasn't until I went to prison and went through that whole experience and then the sexual assault with the guard that that's when it, I truly knew what true powerlessness was, was at that point. And it, it's a difficult, it's really hard to come back up from that to get your self back together after that kind of an experience, especially for an extended length of time. Jesse, you know, you, you are a lawyer, and, and your brother had been uh, obviously uh, arrested before this happened. Did your perspective on the prison population change after this event? I think my perception of the institution of prisons changed. Um, it was a reality check in terms of what really goes on inside of institutions like that and where the real power is and the abuses they're capable of and carry out every day and, and with total immunity. Did you have any hint of that beforehand? I was like most folks. I guess I was just oblivious to it. 
It didn't concern me. Right. So I didn't pay any attention to it. And if it hadn't been for this incident, you may have stayed oblivious, essentially? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. If, you if, if, if it had not been for this incident, do you think you would have remained oblivious? Probably. Probably. And thus, the importance of getting this story out to more people. It's the old adage about whose ox is gored. Mm -hmm. That if it doesn't affect you, you tend not to pay any attention to it. And that's sad. Why can't this story get more traction? I mean, I was pleased to see that CNN did something, but why no follow-up? Why no return visits on the news? I think it's best stated when I started these Freedom of Information Act cases and I started to get these records showing that the United States government had a series of informants at this place called Elmham City and had prior knowledge of the plan to blow up the Murrow Building. And it's not just me making it up, it's the actual records they produced. And I'm contacted by the media, and, and they were surprised that I gave them copies of it. And I said to them, and even the BBC did too, and I said, here, yes, take them. Are you gonna do this story? And what I essentially heard was, this story is so ugly, we wanna be second. And the only person, the only group entity that did the film or retold the story was the BBC who came and spent a month filming in Oklahoma City, went back and ran it prime time for an hour in Great Britain, and I understand it ran in Europe and most of the world. The only other place, the only place I understand that it has not aired, I talked to the producer, was the United States. So here they, they make a, a film with all this evidence and it won't even be aired on the American television network. Uh, I'm going to open it up to you guys for questions as well. There is a microphone here that we can, is that live and ready to go? Why is it, with the internet and things going viral, why is this not more uh, widely known and distributed? Uh, I think PatCon is all over the internet. I think the iDrive and S drives are now all over the internet. Uh, what I'm hearing now, and I'm trying to verify it, is so much of the, the discovery in criminal cases now is produced to defense counsel on a disk. And the FBI is putting spyware in there that reports back as to what you've looked at, or more importantly, what evidence you didn't look at. And that's why I'm telling people now that when you get this, when I get documents from the government, I don't put it on my computer system, you put it on a standalone system. Nothing is connected to the internet, you put it on a standalone system. But all these stories are getting out there. Uh, it's just that you don't have the punch you would if, if the New York Times or the Washington Post or LA Times would run the stories and they don't seem to want to. And part of that may be that uh, and this is on the internet too, and part of this informant process is they had corrupted, uh, by the mid-90s, ABC News, they had placed uh, a top-level informant at the top level of ABC News, and what these informants do is they kill stories that are unfavorable to the government, and when someone comes forward to the press with, on a promise of anonymity with a story about the government, they turn the names over to the government. And there are stories out there about that, too. I would suggest you also have to know what you're looking for. If it were not for Ari and others, I would not know about the story, and I wouldn't know to look for some of these things, and I wouldn't have known about PatCon until I was sent information just a few days ago about it. So you can, be, you can think you're knowledgeable and sort of uh, well-read and up on the news and still not have a clue what's going on out there. You want, do you want to wrap up? Yeah. <laughs> Because Town Hall will shoot me if we don't. Oh, Town Hall will shoot Ari if we don't wrap up. So I guess we will, <laughs> we will do so. Uh, I, can I say one last yes, thing? Please. You know, I, I started off by asking everybody why they were here tonight, and I, I wanted to say why I was here tonight for, for two reasons. Number one is because Ari asked me, and anything asked me, uh, I would probably do. Uh, almost anything. Uh, <laughs> I know you too well. Uh, but the second reason why is because I'm a big believer in stories and the power of stories. And this is an amazing story, and it's a true story. But the only way true stories work, the only way stories really, really work is when they're heard by more people. 
and the opportunity tonight to hear from Jesse and to hear from the great people on this panel, Mark and Kim and Lizzie, means everything to me because once we start telling the stories and you start listening to them, can we really take away the morals and do something about them? So a round of applause for everybody on the panel. And welcome back the nearly shot Ari Kong. Um, so that's, uh, we're supposed to close at nine, and uh, I really appreciate your attention. And before Dean Niles gets completely out of here, thank you, Mark. Thank you very, very much, and for your work. Um, Jesse left Salt Lake City really early this morning, and he's uh, almost as old as I am, so I know he's exhausted. Thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, there's no words. Really? Kim? Thank you, Lizzie, thank you. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you one thing. Uh, there's a, a book uh, that Charles Epp, a professor at the University of Kansas wrote, and it's called Making Rights Real. It's kind of a technical book, but it really, uh, uh, I, I gave it to Lizzie maybe six months ago, uh, because it, it really drives home the importance of civil rights litigation and what can be accomplished with it. And um, and it may be the only way we can really uh, make a difference. Uh, thank you so much for being here. I really, really appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>